Welcome to Dare to Leap, a conversation and community supporting women just like you to gain the freedom, flexibility, and financial security you desire and deserve with CEO and founder of Virtual Expert Training, Kathy Guggenauer. This is Dare to Leap, and now here's the powerhouse tiara-wearing Kathy Guggenauer. Welcome, everybody. Today, I have a very special treat for you and me because I get to interview a journalist and many other things that I'll get to tell you about her. I get to interview her. So I get to turn the tables on Barbara Field. And you're going to really want to get to know Barbara because she is amazing. So let me tell you just a little bit about her. She is a writer a corporate marketer, a keynote speaker, an instructor, and a small business owner. She's got one busy life, doesn't she? And, you know, she just makes it all work together in such a beautiful way. She founded Writing Life Stories to help non-writers write their memoirs. She worked for CBS, Harcourt Harcourt Brace, You know what? I've heard that name Harcourt Brace many times, but I never saw it written out. I'm like, oh, that's what they're saying. (laughs) UC San Diego and Pace University. Barbara was regional manager of the op-ed project and a mentor for the Afghan Women's Writing Project. She writes regularly for Very Well Mind and has published in Shape AARP, The Girlfriend, New York Daily News, The Independent, Newsday Salon, Al Jazeera, Writer's Digest, Columbia Review. That's just to name a few. And her novel, The Deeper, The Bluer, won a Writer's Digest Fiction Award. Barbara and I met recently via Zoom, and I will tell you instantaneously, I felt like I had a new best friend. She has a huge heart and a brilliant mind. Welcome, Barbara. Oh, thank you. That was so nice. So, so nice. Thank you. I'm so thrilled to talk to you, Kathy, about anything you want. <laughs> <laughs> you never know where we will go. I, that is for so sure. Because <laughs> you and I both are like, that, so, we have so many interests. Right. And we have a lot of life experience. We are, we are like fine. We're like really fine wine <laughs> that right. is just improving and improving. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, um, I had the pleasure, I would like to tell your listeners that I had the pleasure of meeting Kathy because I interviewed you for an article about three women entrepreneurs who are crushing it. And that just was published in um, Next Avenue, which is owned by PBS. And so Kathy is, uh, yeah, you're amazing. So I'm really glad to be here and we'll have fun. I want to talk with you. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, everything that we talk about, like that article, we will put a link to everything Barbara shares because she's got a lot of information to share, like a link to her book and everything else we talk about, including that article. We'll put links in the show notes. Right. Yeah. So, Barbara, um, I almost couldn't even breathe. I had to take breaths in between all of the things that you have accomplished but I'd like to go back to wherever you want to start. So you can tell us how, how did you become this amazing writer who gives back, who helps others, who is just, um, you know, does everything. And you seem so very happy. Every time I talk to you, you just seem full of joy. So talk about where you started and challenges along the way and how you got to where you are today. You don't need to summarize. I'll ask you questions as we go. Oh, wonderful. So, you know, it's funny, Kathy, because I think um, I knew I wanted to be a writer when I was, I don't know, seven, eight years old, something like that. And I wrote really bad poetry and I wrote a book and then I wrote a second book and it took me like 30 years to write another book after that. But the point was, I just, I just knew I loved writing and I knew I wanted to be a writer. 
So, so Barbara, what, how old were you when you wrote the bad poetry and you wrote your first book? Um, I would say eight or nine. I was starting. To- oh my gosh. I love that so much. Yeah. So I, I knew, and I think for a lot of kids in their twenties and stuff now it's sort of, it's not fair because you don't know you want to be work on podcasts or you don't know you want to be a web designer for the legal industry or whatever. There's so many options now, but so I just kind of knew. And um, so all of these different things that I've done, I wish I could say that it was all purposeful, but a lot of things I fell into or there were opportunities or there was luck. Um, I want to tell you that I've gotten work for different things based on everything from being working for a temp agency and then being hired to meeting somebody on the street in Manhattan who was having yogurt and she invited me to a women's executive luncheon. Then I got hired to be a ghostwriter by somebody else. I mean, so it was serendipity, a lot of hard work, resumes, blah, blah, blah. But it was it was both. And it was hardship that ended up leading me to one thing or another. But what I really, I really wanted to share, if it's okay with you, is I was thinking about your, your podcast is, and I've been listening to a few, they're wonderful about daring to leap and it's taking those risks. And I, I can't say all these things that I've done have been because I've been confident and I've just been able to take a risk and leap. I'd have to say, I was thinking about it before I got on with you. There were two things that I did when I was working at a university. I lived for 30 years in San Diego and I was working for a university there. And there were two things that I did that had nothing to do with my job. And those things prepared me then to take the bigger leap that I then, two big leaps that I then took. So one of the things that I did when I was working at UC San Diego is I kept reading about um, uh, at things in Afghanistan and things happening to women there and um, how women ha- didn't have a lot of freedom. And I just kept thinking I would love to do something. And I always try to do something related, not always, but to writing or literary aspect, because that's kind of all I know. Um, I'm, I'm really bad at almost like everything. Writing, it's like I'm not as bad at, but it's kind of like, Oh, Barbara, that is so funny. You're really bad at almost everything except writing. And I know that is not true, but but it's interesting that you think that way. It's so funny (laughs) because I swear people say to me like, Oh, I, I hate writing. I hate spelling. I'm like, I'd love to talk to you because I love working with people who hate writing also. And it's, it's so, in fact, just kind of a joke apropos of nothing, but some people say to me, um, oh, you know, I'm the worst, um, um, the worst speller, or I can't write, you know, or I hate writing, or I'm really bad at writing. You said that in one of your podcasts to one of your people, yep. and, and, and which you're not. But I always say that the smartest people I know are actually terrible spellers. And I'm a great speller. I'm a really, really great speller. <laughs> so anyway, what happened was I was at the university and I was reading about these Afghan women and I didn't, I just read about some organization that was out of New York started by a journalist from Brooklyn and it was called the Afghan women's writing project. And um, in it, and, and she, uh, women would sneak out at the risk of death. People, you know, my fellow friends who, have won national book awards and Pulitzers, you know, I'm not talking about writer's block or things like, you know, hard time writing or these travails and tribulations of, of writers here. But I mean, really at risk of death for writing and expressing yourself. And I just started thinking, I want to do something. Well, they had some famous writers who were helping mentor. And I thought, well, I'm living in San Diego working for a university, writing about like bankruptcies and web things. They're never going to accept me. And then I just decided I'm going to write them a pitch letter. I would love to help them and be a mentor. It was all volunteer anyway. But I wrote this letter 
And they welcomed me. Um, the head of the organization was like, we would love to have you mentor. I didn't have to travel to Afghanistan. I just sat in my living room in San Diego and really it wasn't even editing or working with them to that level. It was encouraging writers. Every, everyone from, I remember one young woman wanted to bring ice skating to Afghanistan. Another young woman wanted to run for in parliament. So it was just, they wanted to have certain kind of lives and it was so moving, so touching. I remember one woman writing a story about um, when she grows up and has kids, she's when she serves dinner, she's not gonna serve her sons first. She's gonna serve her son and daughter at the same time. And I was so moved by these stories that were, yes. wow, they were, right? So yes. powerful. And so they allowed me to be a mentor. And what, what this was, was the most humbling, beautiful gift for me about the power of writing, encouraging them to be a mentor. Um, I mean, encouraging them to write. So that was my step. I asked if I could do this to help them. And it was the biggest gift for me. And it was like my, I had to have done that first before I did things later. So once I would, I did that, then I, I was following something. Actually, my son was at Stanford and I wanted to, he was like, you don't have to visit. I'm fine. I was like trying to find an excuse to visit him. And so, <laughs> so I was looking at what was going on there and they had something there called the op-ed project. I think it was there, housed there first. And it was started by this wonderful woman called Katie Ornstein. And it was somehow housed at Stanford. And I said, I wanna do something. What it was, was helping women become thought leaders in their different industries by publishing opinion pieces in New York Times, Wall Street Journal, because um, for many years, I'd say up to the last five or so, all the opinion pieces were pretty much written by men. And so I thought, oh, this is- Up so until the last five years, it's been that five or recent? Ten. Yes. Yeah, I believe it. it. Isn't that amazing? Well, also shocking news in the in the book reviews were by and large by male books by a huge I used to have the numbers I don't have it offhand by the usually the books that were reviewed were by and large by men the reviewers were predominantly men so this is just the way things were and and whatever and they haven't changed that much or and it hasn't been till recently so I thought oh my god this is my excuse to visit my son Adam and I'm like, oh, by the way, I'm going up for this project. He's like, right, mom, <laughs> right? You're coming right around my birthday. I get it. And I'm like, no, 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 really? <laughs> I'm coming up for this. I had to make a damn excuse to visit my son. <laughs> and so I ended up going up there, but I don't even think I met the people there. I ended up writing to Katie. They then moved to New York. I was still in San Diego. I'm from New York, by the way. And so I wrote her another letter, just like I had done for the Afghan Women's Writing Project. This, The idea of all of this is just asking for like what you want, just your dream. Um, and also, um, I just decided to write this letter. And meanwhile, I had this job and I, oh, I forgot to tell you the big thing. I was a single mom for so many years in San Diego and struggling, I might add, because there's not a lot of work in a surfer town. Now there's a lot of biotech there, but in marketing, writing, editing, that kind of thing. So I, it was it was a little dicey and stuff. So here I am now. My son gets into this great school. He's very smart smart kid. And, uh, and so I have this excuse to visit him. And then I started, I don't know which came first, but I wrote to Katie and I said, because my background was marketing, I figured out a way they were setting themselves up in different cities to teach women with a seminar and then helping them write these op-eds and get them published. I figured they're not going to consider San Diego. Maybe they'll have LA and San Francisco. And I figured San Diego was starting to get a lot of more women in science and tech. And I figured you're not reaching those women. That's an angle, right? I figured out a marketing mm -hmm. angle. So I said, maybe I can bring it here. 
So I ended up working for, uh, for and with them and they made me regional manager. I was just going to volunteer and do this stuff. Oh my gosh. You and became then, regional. You were going to volunteer and you became regional manager. And I, I love that so much. Manager, and I picked these women who would take these uh, one day intensive course and then go on to do all these amazing things from different backgrounds. So it's, I started to realize, I didn't even realize yet what my my interests were, but I started to see, I really like the, being a single mom opened my eyes about a lot of uh, economic inequities between women's pay and stuff like that. I started to see, I'm getting more and more interested. Then I wrote a, a novel about four single uh, women who meet by a pool and what happens with them. And I started to realize this thing about motherhood, single women, women pay, this is my interest. I didn't know it was my interest till I started to do things and head in that direction. So one of the things I would like to point out is um, ask and just try, but also I'm the kind of person who always overthink and I like degrees. I was raised in the Northeast. You go to school, you go to college, you go to this, you do this, you get a good job, another job. It was almost like I was over bookish, maybe you could say. I could tell you a really good story. When I had Adam, oh my God, my mother, who is not over bookish at all, she grew up at Brooklyn. She's a street smart woman. Um, when I had Adam and I gave him his first or second bath, my mother was with me and he was a baby. And I'm holding the book, like how to give your baby a bath. Oh my and gosh, I love that so much. I'm holding the book and I'm like, my mother's standing there next to me. She doesn't say anything. And I'm like, check for tepid water, hold baby ginger, like, you know, carefully. <laughs> and after like a minute or two, my mother goes, put the goddamn book down. You just put the baby in the water and make sure it's not too hot. Get a towel ready. What are, why are you looking at the books? Like put the book down. What is it with you? Oh my yes, gosh. I'm like, honestly. I, I'm like, well, how do you do it? What's the right way, goody girl, whatever, the right way to do things. And that's really been to a detriment. And I want everybody who's listening, who's trying to go into a business or be a virtual assistant or is a, is a lawyer and wants to change or whatever, you know, not overthinking, not that you need degrees. I think my reaching out to these two places was the biggest thing for me and leaping. Um, and daring to leap. It was like giving myself permission to do something meaningful to me. But I've got to tell you how it changed my career by accident. Once I did the Afghan Women's Writing Project, Kathy, once I did, I was involved in the op-ed project, well, especially the Afghan women one, I started, I was asked to speak all over the place. I was asked, oh. I gave a keynote spe speech for the uh, uh, a university's women's conference. Then I was asked by corporations to speak about women and about stories and all that kind of thing. This ties into my business now, memoir writing. So you'll see, it's not like a journey that's straight. And I don't know if your listeners can empathize with that or understand that because sometimes we think- I oh, can definitely oh. empathize with it. Right? Because I can, you went I, yes. blogs and- No, I don't think anybody's life is really straight exactly. if they are excelling and really loving what they do. I, I don't know anybody who's had straight. I mean, it, it just doesn't happen, right? Yeah. And if I knew the writing thing was important, I knew that I wanted to stay with that somehow, but- you notice the Afghan women's writing project is involved writing. You notice the op-ed project, it's women helping social justice, helping people, helping people, helping the world, contributing, doing something you love, somehow related to writing again. But once I did those two, my career, oh my God, I was still working for the university, but I was, people were seeking me out from New York. I was like a, invited to speak at a conference back in New York. Um, so also I was on the cover of the San Diego Union Tribune on the cover wow. of a newspaper wow. 
And so I didn't have traction. I had a lot of struggle trying to get work, trying to write, doing it the accepted way of resumes and follow up. But once I did, I took a risk and I asked for something just to make me happy, volunteer. It ended up- You followed your passion. You followed your passion. And I followed something that interested you. You went, oh, this interests me. And And you gave of yourself. You gave first. Is that what you're saying? I gave first. And I think for me, to be honest, I was a struggling single mom. I finally gave myself permission to do something I wanted. Working at the university was great, but I wasn't writing books like my friends were. My friends were already winning all these awards. I wasn't able. I still had to take care of my son. So I was like, well, what can I do that'll make me so happy? And I was like, I really want to do this. I really want to do the Afghan thing. And it wasn't even a big deal. I did it for three months or two months, but it changed my life. Then I had enough confidence to ask the op-ed project because my God, the New York Times, Washington Post, I was like, whoa, who knows if, you know, okay, that gave me more confidence. But it was like, as you said, following your passion, but also giving yourself permission and risk. I love that. Giving yourself permission, permission, passion, risking permission. That's awesome. That was great advice. Don't think that I realized any of this while I was doing it. It's only now in retrospect getting ready to talk to you that I'm thinking (laughs) my biggest leap is moving back to New York City at the age of 50. I don't even remember five, eight, six, whatever I was. And then and then doing starting the memoir business, which I want to tell you about why I started it. And that was the big leap that I want to talk with your 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 people about because yeah, I want them to hear. Let's pause people. just a second because I want to make sure we yeah. talk about the memoir writing. Yes. But first, I want to just go back and uh, comment on a couple of things. One is, and sure. Barbara, I have said this thing too, and I want us to examine this for a minute because you are really into helping women, as am I. And when you said, um, and this might not be your exact words, but it was just accident. It was luck. But guess what? It really wasn't just that. Because I've said that too. I used to say, I make money by accident. But that's not really true, is it? Because if you had not given yourself permission, if you had not taken that risk, Mm -hmm. if you had not pursued what was really interesting to you, even though I'll bet you were scared or hesitant in some way, you, it it wouldn't have happened. So it wasn't really accident. No, it wasn't. It was really something you did. Exactly. And 30 years of very hard work before it or 40, whatever. But what I, I think you're absolutely right. I'm just saying that sometimes when you take those kind of risks, I didn't expect my career to be affected and to be helped by doing this. So it's funny how when you do one thing, and I've spoken, I've, I've given speeches about this, when you do one thing that gives yourself permission or confidence, it helps you in everything, it, it, right? Yes. It's, it, you don't know where it's going to take you. You don't know right? where, that's the way, that's what I mean. You don't know. Yeah, I'm, that's so exciting. I'm glad really, I'm I, that's what I found exciting. Exactly. What, is, what an adventure we're on, right? Well, you don't know where it, Exactly. You don't know where it's going to take you. I never expect to be keynote speaker. I was always shy when I grew up. And when I went to Barnard in Columbia, um, I was so, I studied with a famous writer and I was the only girl in the class. And I was so nervous. I used to throw up in the bathroom. Like I was so shy. I was so shy. So for me then to be a keynote speaker and to be, but it was, it was just like, it's really interesting um, about, I don't know where, where these things lead, but I just, how do you think, so one other question on this and then we're going to go memoir writing anybody, because I'm going to tell you there, I know tons of people that listen to this podcast who are right now thinking, how did she get the nerve to do it? Because I am too scared because I don't feel like I can take that risk because, you know, I'm going to keep hiding. So any tips, like how, how did you give yourself permission? How did you take that risk? That's such a good question because I think it's not always the big things. 
it's it's sometimes the little things the taking the smaller risks that gives you the yes. muscle or the power so for me to be honest that afghan women's writing project i had a job finally that had benefits for nine or ten years at a university i was in the business area i was not teaching writing i was in the business area doing like more marketing and special projects when I sat there and I was struggling with raising my son and he's, he was really good, but it was just the financial end. I was like, you know what? I'm not writing my book now. I don't have time to write it. I don't have the bandwidth. I want to do something for me. I wasn't doing anything for me. So mm. Afghan women, I also knew it wasn't a year or two year commitment or part-time commitment. It was a month or three months. I thought I could do this on weekends. I could do this. And I knew that um, I had the, see, passion is a great word, but I think sometimes it scares people because they're like, I don't have a passion for anything. I like doing this. I like gardening. So why do I have to have a passion? Sometimes people, you know, I just happen to have a passion for writing all my life. But so I think it helps people to take a risk by doing small things. Like I, I knew it was a month or two or three. I wasn't jumping all in. I wasn't giving up my job. I wasn't, I think that's it. The smaller. I, I love that. Yes, because, because the smaller thing you can, I, I can take that risk. Right? A manageable. And then. Yes, manageable. It, a risk. it wasn't even a risk. It was an ask going out of my comfort zone. Then because I did that, I did the op-ed project. The op-ed project is opinion, editorial opinion. It's, you know, the part of the newspaper where people write their opinions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So once I did that, I think, I don't know, it gave me more confidence. And then, as I said, I, I honestly, I had more confidence about going back to New York after being away over 30 years and going back to the city. And then when I went back to the city, I wanted to tell you, is it okay if I talk about the memoir writing my business, why I started oh. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I just want to, I want to ask you about that. I want to say one more thing. You just opened my eyes to something, Barbara. Tell me. Because you are absolutely right that that word passion is too big and scary and feels almost like a commitment and like you have to have this burning desire mm -hmm. and almost nobody knows. I didn't. I wanted a burning desire but it didn't happen. A lot of people don't. And I think it's a disservice sometimes because they say, follow your passion. And Joseph Campbell, follow your bliss. Well, your bliss might be cooking and gardening and not necessarily, you might not want to make a career out of being a chef right. or having a garden store, or you might, it, it, it might just be your, your love. You don't want to commingle that with your work. And in yeah. some ways it's been harder to make a, a living in marketing and writing and copywriting and speaking and books and articles and blah, blah, blah. Harder because you're constantly doing it for a living. So some people separate it. Plus you don't always have that, as you said, that burning desire. You just love to do it. You, you might love sitting around in your pajamas and chillaxing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, and I remember Oprah, I remember Oprah saying, and, and when she said, this is what gave me permission was when Oprah said, your thing you want that you enjoy might be just like you just said, Barbara, your thing you enjoy might not be being president of a company. It might be reading a good book, having time, and the energy, having from. time with your kids. Right? Exactly. Exactly. So, okay. So let's let now talk about why you decided to start the memoir writing and mm -hmm. who you're helping and all about that. I'm super excited to explore that. This is kind of a dramatic story. So I went back to Manhattan <laughs> and um, I had gone to school. I had worked many years and um, I was I was thrilled to be back there. And then unfortunately, I had a weird situation. I got really, really sick. So I had, um, I guess, it's very common when your appendix um, bursts, it's acute pain, you go to the hospital, you have an appendectomy or whatever, and you go home. And it's painful, acute pain. I had a kind of weird thing 
where my appendix had burst, but perforated into six or eight of my organs. And so I was walking around, not feeling well. Oh my God is right. I see you mouthing it. I have never heard of this. I had and never it heard sounds it horrendous. It sounds horrendous. Life-threatening. Awful. It was because I had something called sepsis. In which oh my gosh, definitely life-threatening. Only ten percent of people survive that, don't they? I don't. I don't even know the numbers, but my doctor—it's it's something crazy like that. They not only couldn't believe why why I was still alive. My surgeon told me, whatever happened to me happened not a week before, not two weeks before, not three weeks before, at least three weeks or a month before. And he didn't know why I was living. I said, I'm really healthy. I lived in San Diego. Everybody exercises there, which I don't like exercising, but I always did it. I like reading books and going to art museums. And I was like, I'm really healthy, you know? And he goes, I could tell you're healthy. Your body walled off 80%. And you, I can't believe they put me in the hospital right away. So I have to tell you what happened. I was there 12 days, uh, very, wow. very, very sick. And they, you know, they weren't sure if I was going to live. My yeah. son, my sisters and my son came from California. And when my son was standing there, you know, I was a single mom. He's now close to 30. When I, my son was standing there, I remember thinking he doesn't really know who I am. And we, he knows the stories about me and he knows me and he, we're fairly close, I guess. But, you know, there are a million little stories you don't have the time, for, especially nowadays. Anyway, it was just a thought. I thought, okay, this is it, whatever. Uh, and, okay, keep that thought in mind. Okay, so I go home. I'm recovering. They saved my life. I'm so lucky in that respect. And um, I go home. It took weeks till I could walk down the street. It took about a month or I don't know, a month or two, I don't remember. So I'm back home and I'm thinking, am I gonna go back to marketing? I was doing ghostwriting then, I was helping accreditation for a school. I was doing a lot of different projects. And then I thought, do I go back to this? Uh, do I, I love writing, do I wanna teach writing? A lot of people teach plot and character and how to write books and novels. And then you've even had wonderful people on your podcast who have copywriting businesses and ghostwriting and they write the business. And I thought, I don't really wanna, I don't wanna do that anymore. And I'm not sure what. I go to sleep and I wake up with this epiphany. I wanna help people with story, S-T-O-R-Y, stories. Now, I don't know if you know this, but stories are very powerful, even in marketing and business. There's a whole movement about telling stories, not only genuine and personal and less marketing, it's also a study actually at Stanford Business School. My son wasn't there, but Jennifer Akers, wonderful researcher, says people remember stories more than facts, 22 times more, 22 times more. Oh, I believe that. Because you know, look at your grandfather. I can totally relate to that. Look at your grandfather telling anecdotes and and about growing up. Those little stories we remember our stories. So, I was mm -hmm. thinking. I, I always knew the power of story, and now there's people reading. You know, they give their stories live. The Moth and workshops. Oh and yeah, editing. I love the Moth, and I love all the different story. You see, all the abilities people thought, have. Yeah. So I thought I want to do something with that. Well. I woke up with that epiphany, honest to God, I swear to you, a day or two later, the New York Times had an article about older people telling their stories and writing story classes and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, well, these are like in nursing homes or whatever, I can't make a living doing that. Well, they quoted somebody in California, USC or UCLA, who had been there for years in this guided way of teaching um, that teaches people how to tell their stories in a guided way. Well, I ended up speaking with her. I ended up taking the class and being licensed, credited, whatever. It was certificate, whatever it was called. And I loved it. And the reason why, remember I told you that overthinking bookish person, I love that it has mm -hmm. 30, 35 years of research behind it in medical journals, psychological journals, how this methodology helps you not just write your story and write a memoir, but it helps you feel good about yourself, make see your life in order, have more resilience. It, 
it had all this research. Remember, I love that academic. Does it increase your confidence too? Because yes. I'm loving all this stuff. Yes. And it has just wow. so, so because when you, t- so anyway, I ended up taking the course and then I developed my own. And basically I'm going to tell you, you and your listeners, I encourage you to take a memoir writing course at your local university, but you're not going to be taught the same way. I teach a different way. I took one of those memoir writing courses at NYU uh, just for fun to see what it's like. You'll have a wonderful teacher who a professor who or instructor who's written one or two memoirs. You'll read two or three great memoirs. You'll have exercises and prompts, write about a pineapple, write a banana, write first tense, second tense but you won't have the impactful stories that you want to tell put together in a way to make a book. So my, all I say is what I love about my methodology, then I change it. I add film clips, I add poetry, I add whatever. The other aspect of a typical memoir. Ooh, that's exciting. Is- you, you do, you add film clips and poetry to your yeah. memoir writing. Oh, yeah. my class- oh my gosh. Like- my multimedia class, i love it yeah my class is like to help you get pages down <clears throat> the other difference is a lot of people who take memoir writing classes at universities or want to publish commercially i've worked for harcourt brace my friends have published commercially i know editors i know agents i had two agents i have one agent maybe i'm not sure because i'm <laughs> anything in a lot of but anyway but my point is i don't <laughs> people to write commercially. This is to give your memoir as a legacy to your kids and grandkids and to discover who you are. So it's a different goal. And the only difference, the way I teach, the biggest difference is it's based on themes and provocative questions and priming questions so that you only write one thing a week. If you take a course at a university, they call it workshop. And at the end of the course, you could share one or two stories. Every week you share your story. And the other big difference is the critiquing part. Critiquing can be very destructive to people, especially sensitive people, especially non-writers. So I took a class at NYU. Uh, There was 15 people in the class. I was the only one who was a professional writer. And people, if they, you know, when you open it up to critique and say, I like this part, I don't like this, or why are you doing this, or add more of this. Sometimes they're wrong uh, from a writing point of view, you know, what makes it engaging. Sometimes it's wrong, but sometimes it destroys people. Like I remember one young woman was Chinese and she shared this very powerful story about an abusive family. And she had to move by herself in, at a young age with her brother to the United States and take care of him. And she ended up being a music teacher and teaching people piano and music. And, and she had a story and it was rambling and all out of order. And everybody was like, I couldn't follow you, whatever. And she was feeling so sad. And I was like, that doesn't matter. You have a powerful story. That's the shaping that we do later. That's the part that we do later in editing. Right now, you told great stories. So people, so I love what I do. It's called Writing Life Stories. I've been teaching it at museums, universities, classes privately I coach one-on-one but thanks to people like Kathy I'm now this summer looking at my model of what I'm going to be giving and doing on my classes but I've helped so many people I have a very robust website you could ask me all that later but I love helping people tell their stories they're usually by and large people 50 to 70 or first generation And then I give some also themed classes, uh, one, you know, those are um, eight week, 12 week. Now I'm going to be making them six months, a year long, those kind of things. But then I gave theme workshop, like I wanted to give back, Kathy. So during COVID, I was giving these workshops on how, how to write a one page dedication for someone you lost during COVID, maybe because of COVID, due to COVID, or cancer or whatever. Um, And so I wanted to do that free. I think once I charged $10, but mostly I did it free online on Zoom. Oh, I had people all Mm -hmm. over the country, New Mexico. I had somebody from Kuwait, um, you know, all over that took it. So I sometimes give themed like two hour classes too, but it's so meaningful and impactful. And that's my business, writing life stories, memoir writing for non-writers. So 
The leap. I love that so much. I would say the, the leap, leap that you took. The yeah, leap was, first of all, having enough confidence in my 50s to move back to New York. And I expected to get a corporate job as I wanted at a university or a corporation like at at Harcourt or CBS in New York, I expected like, or scripts I worked for also, you know, for benefits, whatever. Well, I forgot I wasn't going to be hired in my fifties in marketing. Oh yeah. Ageism. Ageism. I forgot that. I forgot, but I quickly figured it out. Because we know how valuable we are, Barbara, at these ages. Yes. And we can't believe others don't automatically know this too, because they're crazy not to hire you. Exactly. And I didn't feel that way. I didn't feel like they're crazy not to. I mean, I felt like, oh my God, what am I going to do? But this is really morphed into the the big leap was moving back to New York and starting this business, um, memoir writing. And and what I want to say also is, you know, when you do ghost writing, you write business books or memoirs for people. And a lot of people say to me, um, I don't really have like, I'm not famous. I don't have a major story. Well, let me tell you these normal everyday, our cousins, our aunts, our sisters, us, we all have stories, whether it's abuse, death, we've all lost a relative, a loved one. I lost my sister recently. We're a parent and we don't know their stories. We, we we're like, why didn't I ask them? Why didn't I spend the time? Mm. Well, he has the time yes. now even to ask, we barely have time to ask, how's work? How's your wife? How's this? We barely have time. So can you imagine mm-hmm. that we're going to sit down mm-hmm. and hear their stories? So I feel it's the biggest gift you could give yourself and somebody in your family, your kids, your grandkids, or figure out who you are and leave your legacy. So that's my little thing. Oh, I love everything about this so much. And I had no, I, I, I knew I love the idea of you know, having somebody's story, because like, for example, my grandma, who I loved more than anyone in the whole world, I didn't take the time to know her stories. And I so regret it. I so regret it. Yeah. And and I'm sure everybody's got somebody like that, that they regret not having. But also let's give each other, um, not credit, but like not to fault. We live in a different time. When I grew up, we would sit for hours with our cousins over food or lemonade or something in the backyard in the summer or holidays. And you wouldn't Mm -hmm. be going places, doing things. You'd be talking and telling stories, you know, that Mm -hmm. that life Mm -hmm. of sitting on the porch or sitting in the backyard, sharing family where we live close together. So it's not all our fault that we didn't take the time. It's we're living in a different time too. So you're such a kind person, Barbara. You're so kind. I love how kind you are. Oh, it just oozes you. out of you. Oh, you. <laughs> you, you, you know, people say, and this is an aside, people say reframe to a positive. You reframe everything to a positive and oh, it's amazing. I, I just want to be around you to absor- absorb more of that. Oh my God. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So let's talk about the, um, cause I, this, you know, you've heard me say I'm not a good writer. Um, and this, this is something that's kind of a little secret that I have, um, which is when I was eight, nine, 10, I too wanted to be a writer. I would write stories and there were always love stories where, <laughs> There were always love stories where I was, I had a baby and this was 19, like, uh, 1960. Okay. Back then you didn't have babies out of wedlock that easily. Right. I had a baby. Yeah. I was married, but my husband was always away at war. So I didn't have to deal with him. (laughs) And he usually was killed by the end. (laughs) And my girlfriends and I had lots of fun together and we all had babies. (laughs) <laughs> and no, the husbands were never around. Oh, ah, very telling. <laughs> I know. But yet I've never pursued writing because like, I'm sure you hear a lot. I just think I'm so bad at it. And it's but so hard thing, for me. The thing I want to say too, is there's a reason it's good to hire people to write your books as you've done and people yes. ghost writing and people write your story and whatever. And I don't do that anymore 
um, well, I only did it for a brief time for a year or two. Mainly I have my byline and my name on everything I write. But I don't do that anymore because I teach people just to do it like conversation and memory, like we're talking, they're conversations. It's not grammar. It's not whatever. And they just get the stories down about. Oh, I love that. Fishing trip. And then he did this and he shot and he, he got this kind of fish and we came home and we had this food and he was then, you know, this and that they're stories, but mm -hmm. I, I don't want to write other people's stories now. I don't edit mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. look at them. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. I package that. So I want to help mm -hmm. people write their own stories and I want to mm -hmm. write my own stuff. So, so it's separate. Mm -hmm. now, see? So, mm -hmm. yeah, away. I do. So for those people who are like me and are thinking, I hear you saying we can do this no matter what, because it's not grammar or punctuation or, you know, yes. any of that is just getting the story down. But for those who are still like, uh, okay. All right. It sounds because I'm thinking of, I'm actually going through the process in my brain right now going, okay, I can, I'm absorbing what you're telling me. And I do now feel, yes, I'm interested in doing this. It's so awesome. how do people connect with you to sign up to do this? Right. So of course, I would love to hear from anybody who has any questions. I'm happy to help answer your questions right now. Um, uh, for the summer, when you post this right now. Um, yeah, and actually, this probably won't be posted for several months. Oh, so, good, good. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. Talk oh, about. Right. Yeah. So right like now. Like next year, even. Got it. Got Talk it. about 2022. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, the what people can do is find me by very easily. It's uh, writing life stories. One word. Writinglifestories.com or Barbara at writinglifestories.com. And um, I have a you know robust website and they can find all out what's going on there, what the offerings are, all that kind of stuff. And the biggest thing is that I think it takes away the intimidation because you're guided. You're guided. Mm, yes. Um, you know, very clearly you write one story or so a week, but you're really guided so that without even realizing it. There's another component that I wanna mention. Because you hear other people's stories, it's so inspiring to you and it reminds mm. you. I also used to go with my sister through the water sprinkler and have good humor ice cream and I forgot that. And I forgot my sibling relationship and I forgot about that. And so it's so wonderful to hear other people's mm. stories like this who are not writers. So. By the way, I am a writer. I love writing. So do, if you want to write it and you want to write it beautifully, you could take the other kind of courses as well. But for me, what's the point? Because that's for getting published and I've been published and I do publish. So a lot of people want to give it to their families and themselves. They don't want to write for commercial. Right. Exactly. I, I don't want to publish my memoir. You want to give it um, to people in your family or friends or whatever yeah, about your life. Yeah. You know? So and they don't have the regret I do about not knowing my grandma's story. I want my grandkids to have that as a gift. I think that's an amazing gift to give somebody. It's the biggest gift you could give really about who you are. Mm -hmm. And I love it mm -hmm. because, you know, a lot of people don't know what to put in, what to leave out, how to write about difficult things, how to write good things without sounding bragging, how to, you know, all these yes. things. Oh my gosh, that's such a big thing with women. I I don't want to write. That makes me sound like I'm bragging. Yeah. Right. So and you I'm help like, them through that? Oh, it's so easy. I have all these little techniques that <laughs> nothing to oh, do yay. with grammar. And, and it's so focused, but it's a guided method. And I love it. I love it. And I, I encourage people to write their stories. So for me, your story matters. And you can tell it. And you can tell it quickly and easily. And you could do it. And, and you know what? You're suddenly make me, making me realize this is fun. This is going to be fun to do this with fun. you. This is not work. This no. is not scary. This no. is entertainment even. Oh, it's, Because it's, you get to hear the other people's stories. Yes. And it's funny. And you hear like good stories. You hear hard stories. We were crying yesterday at my last class yesterday. Mm -hmm. one thing, and we were crying. Um, and we know, yeah, it's just, it's fantastic. And it's, it's your life, your story. I have one quote I want to tell you. Anne Lamont, who's a writer I love. 
She says, love Anne Lamont. She oh, is she the one that wrote Bird by Bird? Yes, yes. She wrote, yeah. People worried you on everything that happened to you. She said, if people wanted you to write warmly about them, they should have behaved better. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll leave you with that. You can write anything you want. You own your story. You should have behaved better. I love it. I love it. I love it. You know, we often think, I do, I think about leaving a legacy, but I don't think about, I haven't before now thought about leaving a legacy of stories. I've thought about leaving a legacy of property, uh, you know, like real estate or money, you know, uh, but not stories. And honestly, now that you've got me thinking about this, that's the most important piece, not the real estate, not the money, but the stories. Because really they reflect the essence of who you are, where you came from, what you did. Mm -hmm. By telling the story, we learn about you and your values Mm -hmm. without you telling them to us necessarily. We learn all Mm -hmm. about who you are, where you came from, you know, Mm -hmm. um, and they're so rich. And, and even if you take a topic, I give themes like, they're not rocket science predicting them. What do you think they are? They're either childhood, gender, uh, work, you know, uh, children, you know, there's different kinds of themes, but you couldn't believe the range of stories that come. You think, well, they're all going to be about this or that. No, there's no predictable. Everybody has a different story and they're amazing. And they're just amazing. And then you string them together. And then the other part that I love about this my friend Tim Page is a music critic, was a music critic. He's written books. He won a Pulitzer, either New York Times, Washington Post. Can't remember. And he said, oh, I love what you're doing, Barbara. I love this. I'm like, why would you love it? It's not about writing or the craft or really the beauty of the words or how to write better. And he said, well, you know, we always have to get it down first. And I think the biggest thing is People think, well, I have to polish it. It doesn't sound good. This and that, that stops people from writing. Like you said, yes, oh, it I've, stops I've, me. <laughs> it stops everyone from writing. And if you know, it's like a conversation or a memory, you're just going to write it the way you think it or say it, it frees you. And what Tim is right, because I know as a professional writer, when I wrote the thing about you or anybody interviews I do or any essays or anything, First, I have to get it down. Only then later, you could edit it a little, clean it up a little, maybe here or there. That doesn't matter, but most people don't get it down first because they're mm. intimidated by the writing. Yeah. Process. Or yeah. They, even, even the ones who want to publish commercially don't finish because they're, so, they're editing every story, polishing it, tightening it. And that's just a different way to write if you want to, like I respect that because I want to publish under my name for money and and get it done and get it out there so i understand that i want to polish it but first i have to write a draft or for me three or four you know or for the Mm -hmm. last article about you guys i think there was yeah three or four or five drafts yeah so wow so um Barbara, I would like to spend a little bit longer with you. And I know we're actually at the top of the hour. Do you have another five or 10 minutes to spend with me? For you. Yay. Yay. Um, Because I want to explore a little bit further who it is that's going to be like, I have a couple of questions for you specifically. I I want to do this. (laughs) And I know my husband, he has amazing stories because he's told me many of them. Um, But the act of actually writing is incredibly difficult or even reading is incredibly difficult for him because he has extreme dyslexia. I mean, it's literally, he tells me it's literally painful for him. So what would you tell somebody like that? Who, you know, like I would love for my husband to take this course also Um, is that let's just say he, can he, does he speak easily? Can he have, Oh yes. Easily? Can he tell yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It's just happened. the actual, it's the actual typing or writing or reading written word that right is difficult. Now, there's so many of us, even in business, we record things and then we mm-hmm. use in service. You have a transcriber probably, right? For your yep. recording. Yep. He records yep. it. They transcribe it. He has a story. Awesome. Yes. Right? Yes. I would love that. Oh my gosh. That, that's so such a simple still- solution. He still has to tell the story, but mm-hmm. also it doesn't have to be 
I, I require it in writing because what happens in, in classes, honestly, is that sometimes people start and they write a line or two and then they start talking it. And then it goes on and on and they're tangent. Uh, yes. And yes. then you don't focus. So I require mm -hmm. that you have to have it written. I never mm -hmm. see I never see the piece of paper. Mm -hmm. because it's mm -hmm. all shared orally. Okay. So it has to be typed up, but also to have a book, you have to have the stories done and typed up. Yeah. So, you have but to have he could he could do that. He could talk it, and I could just have it transcribed. Exactly. Or I, you know what? One of my passions is one that that <laughs> I'm correcting my own grammar as I speak. Oh, you know what? You one of my passions is what? Correct. <laughs> typing. Typing. You love typing. I frigging love to type. Oh, it's so reassuring. The rhythm. <laughs> the yes. But the thing is, I just you, can, can he read it aloud once he once it's typed? Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. actually, I was thinking about that. And at first I thought, well, I could just read it for him. But then I thought, no, it's going to be so much more powerful if he reads it. And he would he would he would be willing to read it. Yeah, It and just, you know, it, some, there's, he has to be in a reassuring area and with people who are not going to make fun of his slowness of reading. And yeah. I know you're, I know how kind you are and you would be, you would have that. Exactly. And, and also it becomes, you know, right now, as I've talked to you, I'm, I have uh, the groups that I do teach are very private, small groups and yes. I might be expanding that, but um, we'll see. But anyway, um, you'll help me. Yeah. We'll figure that out, but yes. And I yeah. don't know if this is going to be part of on tape or not. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Unless you don't want it on here. Oh, Absolutely. No. Are you kidding me? I share everything. Yeah. <laughs> so right now, I don't know how specifically I could help you exactly, but. Um, no, you know, I love it. You've already given me tons of ideas. Well, Have you ever had a couple do it together where no, the one, you know, one writes her story and the other one writes his story? No, because I kind of would separate you guys. So you guys feel free okay. of not being together oh. to talk about things mm. that you might want to talk about. Let me give you an example. <laughs> I've had a private client. <laughs> we finished after close to a year. She was married about 30 years. She got divorced and she had some kids. So at the end of we're right about, you know, she wants to put it together, the final book, whatever. And I said, okay, now she's friendly with her ex-husband. She's going to give it to her kids. I said, now, uh, just looking at the weight of the book and everything that happened to you in your life, you were with your husband 30 years. I think we have one line about him in the whole book. <laughs> I think we need a chapter. And she didn't want to write about the early divorce and the, the breakdown of the marriage. And that's sort of what she remembered, how it wasn't what she thought it was going to be. I'm like, how about we write the chapter of how you met and what you fell in love with or, you know, that can oh. be the oh, See, so, see how you reframe everything. That's amazing. You took you. this horrible, horrendous memory she had and turned it into something beautiful. Well, it's up to her to choose, but I just helped guided her at the end. Yeah. But that was yeah. my private client. Usually I don't read a, a, in paper. I hear the stories and I guide them and I say, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, that's great. Could you add more about this? Or you talked mm -hmm. about this. Could you do this or whatever? But it's all mm -hmm. supportive. The critique part, part I is very important because I've seen it upset people and it, it, people are very fragile. I just want to tell yes. you, apropos of your husband, every class I give, whether I gave one to 200 people for Barnard, alumni, alumni, women. I gave it to the Walt Whitman Museum. I gave it to the Women's Museum of California, New, uh, Sarasota wow. County Libraries in Florida. I always say the first thing after is, I need all of you to agree right now that this is confidential and I want you to feel comfortable here. It doesn't, you could ask permission. I loved your story. Can I tell my husband? Can I share this? Can I? But the idea is this is just between us and you might edit it later. You might do what you want. It's free. You could tell anything how somebody was crappy to you, how somebody was great, terrible stories, good stories. You're free. So that confidentiality mm. is important. Mm -hmm. but you and your husband, mm -hmm. which I would love, I would separate <laughs> you. 
because I would want I would want um, the freedom that you could tell your story your own way. Yeah, I, and, and I totally understand that. Once you said that, I was like, oh yeah, I would edit myself, and I know he would too if we were in the same class. Of course, of course, even yeah. if it was your brother, your sister, your mother, your best friend, mm-hmm. you know, it'd mm-hmm. be fun to do together. Um, bring your friends, you know, but it would be like you wouldn't want to tell that because it makes you look bad. Mm-hmm. Or they think you're that, mm-hmm. and so you're right. totally, totally agree. Story, yeah, yeah. But those mm-hmm. are really mm-hmm. you're asking really, really good questions. And uh, I did once have a woman who uh, took a class. It was at the Women's Museum of California, and she's uh, I uh, it was an introductory class, and she said, "I can't write." I, I said, "Is it physical?" And she goes. No, it's just too hard for me because I'm a writer and I have a lot of ideas. And I said, would you be able to just tell me one story and one conversation and tell it to me now in the hallway about what happened? And she said, yes. And she told me, and I said, could you just write that one now? And she goes, yes, I can. So that was it. You make it so easy, Barbara. You make it so easy. I, I have to tell you, I taught at a golf school in Rancho Santa Fe, California to golfers. I'm can't do any sport whatsoever. I'm like, really, yoga, maybe I cheat a little bit, you know, um, I follow. I love yoga, but I fall over. (laughs) (laughs) Well, anyway, um, I taught at this golf school to all these, what I call jocks, you know, all these athletes. I know nothing. I don't watch any sports. My son did every sport. I never knew what was happening. He got in the basket. I knew to stand up basketball. He hit it with the bat. I knew in baseball. Yay. Every other rule after years, I went to every game. I knew nothing. So I'm teaching at a golf school and I, I make, I'm, I try to make it easy. And as I said, I love when people hate writing or find it difficult because I try to make it easy. So that, mm-hmm. that's my goal to make it uh, less intimidating. It's your story. And you could tell a story in conversation, memory. It's your story. I love it. I love it so much. Okay. So now that we have explored this in beautiful detail, um, and again, this is, you're so perfect for doing this, which you obviously know, but I just keep going back to, I would feel so safe taking this course with you because not only do I know how good you are at helping people process this or, um, tell their story, but you're so kind that it, you're not going to hurt anybody's feelings no matter, you know, cause we all got, we all have crazy stories, right? <laughs> Can I just tell you, I think my job in teaching is to really all these women and men who are, you know, um, they've had jobs or they've had kids. And I just said, my job is really to strip away all the professional stuff we learned and how we want to sound and just to be real and talk like we're talking right now. Tell me and what happened and where. And that's my job yeah, to like yeah. kind of take away everything that they, you know, you, you want to try to sound like you want to sound professional. You want to sound smart. You want to sound this, forget all that stuff. Just talk to me, you know, tell me your story. Mm-hmm. Tell mm-hmm. Me your I love story. it. I love it. Okay. So everyone who's listening and now they're like, I want to do this, or I know somebody that I want to tell this to about, um, Tell us again where to go. And then on your site, um, you're going to have like um, the information whenever anybody listens to this, I don't care if it's today, two years from now, yeah. um, you're going to, if you're still doing this, which you will be, I know. Cause you're going to, Oh my gosh, you're changing you. people's lives, Barbara. Um, like- you're going to have the next time somebody can sign up and how they oh, can yeah. sign up and all of that on of your website. Scheduled. Um, on the um, classes and it's a robust website testimonials FAQs it's a very robust website and um, yeah and it's um, the website is writing life stories one word dot com and you could contact me Barbara at writing life stories dot com that's it well and I am gonna put all of that in the show notes and by the way, as soon as we're done here today, I'll be running, running right over there and see what you've got going on next. Cause I'm, st- <laughs> I, I don't wait. I get excited about something. I'm like, let's do it. Let's go. <laughs> okay. 
Well, you could stay on a minute after the taping and I'll, I'll let you okay. know. Okay, cool, cool. That's, that sounds great. And um, as a total aside, I will tell you when you said, <laughs> you know how sometimes you get triggered by something and you go, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize I had that. Um, when you said, well, we're, I'm going to separate you and your husband. All I could think about was in school when I constantly, we're separating you two because you talk too much. <laughs> and they would move me somewhere else. <laughs> and then of course I would talk to that person and the teacher would go, I'm separating you. Literally Barbara, as an adult going to like Zumba or, uh, you know, exercise group exercise classes as an adult at this age, I am still separated. Uh-huh. Kathy, you are distracting the class. Uh-huh. We are separating you and whoever you're with. Well, you know what it is? <laughs> um, I've had people that want to write, you know, that not only want to bring a spouse, but um, they want to write about somebody else too. So it's oh, just, yes. it's just a very, you know, a lot of writing classes are more open, like write about a pineapple, mm. write about a banana, write about the weather today. Mine's not at all. Every I don't want to write about any of that like, stuff. <laughs> it, it's really like, we're writing about this and you're going to see a little film clip about this. And then we're going to talk about this and then you're going to do this and do an exercise and you're going to go home and do that. It's so guided. It's so, Ooh, like, I love it. It's so guided that you're going to be like, wow, I didn't, I thought I was going to write about this, but then uh, wow. Mm-hmm. And then, so it's mm-hmm. really, I hold your hand kind of thing. Oh. So when I say separated. I promise it wasn't, you were talking bad. I, no, I know. I know that I, I absolutely knew it, but right. <laughs> My childhood came up. I'm, I'm going to be separated. I'm in trouble again. The you know, teacher doesn't like me. No, no. It's just that it would hold you back from, from being no, real. I totally honest. understand. It would hold you both. Yeah. It would hold you yeah. both. Well, I know what I want to do, um, which is when we're going to end here, um, everybody, and then I'm going to talk to Barbara separately, get signed up for her program. <laughs> And I'm going to go and I'm going to go through it first. And then, cause my husband will trust me if I've gone through it, then I will get him to go through it after right, right. I've gone through exactly. it. Oh, That's that'll good. be perfect. Yeah. 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 So everybody, um, if you want to read anything that Barbara has done, um, you can, you the Google, link. Um, yeah, you can Google her name, Barbara Field. You'll see her articles she's written. I'm sure you could go to Amazon and find her books. And you can go to her website and everything will be on there. Yeah. Writinglifestories.com. Barbara, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. I thank you so much, Kathy. This is wonderful. This has been a delight. Thank you for having me. I feel like we've had a little bit of a therapy session here. And I feel like going through your program is going to be a bit of a therapy session for me, too. Yeah, I Do people say, feel, notice that. I say I'm not a, a you know a, a social worker or a psychologist, but it's right. not therapy, but it's therapeutic. But it's also fun. therapeutic. It's that's fun. it. It's also oh therapeutic, but it's fun. It's fun. That's what I'm looking forward to is the fun because I well, love to have fun. Okay, <laughs> you are great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you for listening to Dare to Leap. Say hello and access additional resources at virtualexperttraining.com. There you'll be able to connect with Kathy to share your feedback and join her community. Join us again soon on Dare to Leap. Until then. Mm-hmm.